Okay, now I'm going to go over their strategy for the Islamic world, right? And there's a lot to say here, but let's get to the to the simplest part. However, at the moment, the Islamic world is extremely fragmented, and within it there are various ideological and political tendencies, as well as geopolitical projects that are opposite to each other. The most global are the following trends, Iranian fundamentalism, anti-American, anti-Atlanticist, and geopolitically active. Turkish secular regime, Atlanticist type, assenting the pan-Turkish line, pan-Arabism preached by Syria, Iraq, Libya, Sudan, partly by Egypt, and somewhat by Saudi Arabia, quite diverse and contradictory projects on each case, right? And we we should know this, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into more. Saudi Wahhabi type of fundamentalism, geopolitically in solidarity with Atlanticism. Interesting, right? How they noticed that. Various versions of Islamic socialism, Libya, Iraq, Syria. Um, it is immediately clear that the purely Atlanticist poles in the Islamic world by the secular, as in the case of Turkey, or Islamic, in the case of Saudi Arabia, cannot fulfill the functions of the South Pole of Eurasia and the global project of continental empire. What remains is Iranian fundamentalism and pan-Arabism, the left wing. From the point of view of geopolitical constants, Iran undoubtedly has a priority in this matter, since it satisfy, satisfies all Eurasian parameters. And in Okay, so I'm going to stop and say this, right? You, you know, this was written in 1997. I don't know if Iran was working with Russia back then, but we know they are now, right? So that's how you know that this book has some strategic value to Putin, right? He saw that and said, yeah, you know, Iran is anti-American, anti-Atlanticist. Let's work with them. Out of all these five, and in fact, there's more than five because these are not even in solidarity with one another. They saw them as, you know, the ones that they could work with the most. Iran occupies such a position on the map of the mainland that the creation of the moscow tehran axis solves a huge number of problems in the new empire by including iran as the solution pole of the empire russia would instantly achieve the strategic goal to which it had been going by the wrong paths for several centuries access to the warm seas this strategic aspect Russia's lack of such an exit has been the main trump card of Atlanticist geopolitics since the time of colonial England, which completely controlled Asia and the East. Uh, let's just get to the point here, hold on. The creation of the moscow tehran axis at once cuts the anaconda in the most vulnerable spot and opens up unlimited prospects for Russia to acquire more and more new footholds inside and outside Eurasia. This is the most essential point. On the other hand, there's a problem of the former Soviet Central Asia, where today three geopolitical tendencies, right? Pan-Turkism, Wahhabism, and fun, uh, Iranian fundamentalism. They all compete, right? And we can see that how Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, imports its brand of Islam into Europe, right? And then you also have Turkey trying to influence Muslims in Europe. I'm not really sure exactly what... See, you have to understand in 1997, this was before the time of Erdogan, right? So uh, Turkey was seen as like a secular Islamic, uh, you know, a, a road to secularize Islamic countries. That was their model, right? And so the the Russians, or at least this, the writer of this book, viewed that as a dangerous model. He wouldn't want that to spread. Today, I don't know, they're, you know, with Erdogan, they're a little in between. They're, you know, they're kind of like, I don't know how to explain them, but they're like trying to become more Islamic and less secular. But anyways, for the obvious reason, there could be no pan-Arabism among the Turkish-speaking peoples, right? Because they're not Arabs, so that can't come to them. The, the presence in parallel with this of a powerful pro-Russian pro-Russian orientation should be taken into account, but it's difficult to imagine how these Islamic regions, with their awakening national self and error, can join, again, Russia bloodlessly and painlessly. It is quite obvious. Yeah, and the point is, look, you know, he doesn't see Islam as compatible with his empire, you know, but he does see, you know, Iran as a useful tool. That's definitely it, right? And, you know, Russia, I'm not saying Iran is just a tool. They themselves see Russia is a useful ally, you know, it's a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, and, you know, he talks about countries like Afghanistan. Uh, let's keep going. Um, let's keep going.
uh, there was something interesting here. Let's go right here. Right? It is also important to take into account the need to impose on Turkey the role of a scapegoat in this project, since the interest of this state in the Caucasus and Central Asia will not be taken into account at all. More of what is probably necessary to emphasize the support of Kurdish separationism in Turkey itself, as well as the autonomous demands of the Turkish Armenians in order to wrest the peoples ethnically close to Iran from the secular Atlantis control. Very important, right? You look at today, and who is Turkey fighting against? The Kurdish opposition, right? That's all you need to know. Whether they did this on purpose, it doesn't matter. The fact is that this book was written in 1997, and somehow it's telling you what's happening today. That's all you need to know to know that this book is valuable to read. You gotta, you know, you gotta learn what's in here if you want to understand politics today. And I think they had what uh, a battle against Armenia, right? Turkey backed who? Azerbaijan. So I guess they want to, you know, it has something to do with Turkish Armenians. <laughs> Turkey should be offered either development in southern direction to the Arab world through Baghdad, Damascus, Riyadh, or provoke pro-Iranian fundamentalists in Turkey itself to a cardinal dimension. Okay, let's, uh, so, you know, they say Iranian Islam and the Shias, the best version of Islam for entering the continental bloc, and it is a version that should be supported by Moscow as a priority. Pretty interesting. Um, you know, they talk a bit about the pan-Arabs. You know, they failed anyways, right? Other than Bashar is really the only one standing. And he's not even really Islamic, right? So it's kind of a weird thing, right? Because he lost Libya and Iraq. They're gone now. They failed to really keep them alive. And they regretted it. And you find Putin making statements about how, you know, he, you know, he's like, oh, look, Libya had a good living, blah, blah. You know, he talked good. He kind of like says, oh, look, they took down Libya, America. And so you could see that he kind of, I could see that he regrets not preventing that. This looks interesting. Considering that the model of a purely Iranian fundamentalist is unlikely to become universally acceptable in the Arab world, obviously, right? No, nobody's going to accept Shiism universally. The Pan-Arab project should strive to create an independent anti-Atlantic bloc, where Iraq, Libya would become the prior roles. Interesting, right? Because this is before the wars even happened against Iraq and Libya, and they got taken down. So, I mean, the guy seems to have, you know, he seemed, he knows his stuff, whether you want to admit it or not, and a liberated Palestine. Interesting, right? So they support a liberated Palestine. We don't know, but that's very interesting that he mentions it, right? So maybe, I mean, look, I personally believe that I can recognize uh, Russian troll accounts and their YouTube comments. I feel like I know what the, the pattern is. And one thing I do notice is they are anti-Israel. So it's they do want to influence people to towards that. And I am pretty confident that over the the weekend with all the conflict of uh, Palestine, I'm pretty confident that Russian trolls are on the Palestine side because they want people to, because the, Israel is very Atlanticist. That's all you need to know. They're UK and USA and Israel are best friends, right? So, of course, they're going to view that as, oh, we got to take down Israel then. Those Arab countries that clearly understand the American danger and more radically than others reject the market capitalist model, right? You know, the socialist Arab countries, they don't like uh, capitalism, right? So he doesn't like the liberal capitalist ideology. That's his main enemy, right? And we've heard Putin say before, old oh, liberal idea is uh, getting old or something, you know, so you can see how he's very influenced by this guy's book where, you know, he says, oh, let's oppose the liberal idea. For Egypt, Algeria, and Morocco, the situation is somewhat different. And it's interesting because these are countries that, I don't know, I mean, you don't even know what, who knows what these guys, like, these are three countries you can't even really predict. You can't really work on them. And even he kind of implies it here, right? But it is clearly necessary to understand that the most harmonious structure of the planet is not so much a matter of Russia, but of Europe, right? Um, Iran, which controls Central Asia. It doesn't really control Pakistan. I don't know about that. Qatar, which Russia is a center of priority interest. So, you know, you see it today. They're working with Iran. They're working with Syria, actually. I'm not sure if Syria is mentioned here, though. Yeah, barely mentioned, but uh, you can see that they view that, you know, Syria is an ally of Iran. So I guess they saw that as a, you know, something they could use. And it's working for them. So, yeah, this is the ending of the part about the Middle East.